My name is Peter Roskam. Um, I'm here with my wife Elizabeth. We've been married 30 years. We have four adult children who are all launched out of university, although two of them are still on our cell phone plan, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, but that being said, um, when we received the invitation to come, it was just with a r real sense of joy that, uh, that we accepted the invitation. So it's, it's really nice to be here. I was at, we were on the bus with a number of you, and we were all getting crossed together with uh, how aggravating that traffic is, but we made it. So, uh, so here we are. So let me give you a little bit of, um, little bit of sense of the, the journey that Elizabeth and I have been on, and me in particular as uh, somebody who's held office in the United States. Um, I didn't grow up in a political family at all. I grew up uh, and was introduced to Jesus as a young boy. My parents were deeply committed Christians and um, had the, just the great blessing of that as a, as a heritage. And my older siblings are physicians, and I had no sense of an interest in going into medicine and was one of those young people who constantly found myself drawn to things in history and things in politics. And the key is, what section of the bookstore do you go to when you have 20 minutes? And that tells you that's a foreshadowing of your future life. So if, you're, if you go into that history section, if you go in the politics section, you're, you're, you're well launched. And so that's where, I, that's where I found myself. And so for um, 13 years, I served in the Illinois my home state legislature, and I served in the Illinois House of Representatives and the Illinois Senate. And then in 2006, there was an open seat in the United States House of Representatives, and I ran for that seat and was successful and served for 12 years there. And um, I've served in the minority and in the majority in all three of these institutions. And it's a very interesting thing because you want to be in the majority. It's so much more fun and you can move your agenda with such ease, uh, with comparative ease. But, um, but serving in the minority, there, there's a role for the minority as well. And so during this time, I mentioned this last night in um, some of our discussion, but one of the things that Elizabeth and I really benefited from were a group of Christians at home who came alongside us and prayed for us on a regular, on a regular basis. And I'll just go back and, and give you a quick touch point. Our campaign for office was a highly publicized national election. It's not that I was extraordinarily famous, I wasn't and am not, but the symbolism of the seat was very, very significant for reasons that I could go into but aren't significant for, for right now. And both political parties spent millions of dollars in this single constituency. So all in, over $14 million was spent in my campaign. And it was a campaign, um, that's 12 years ago, so it was real money. And... Um, off we went to this race, and the, the pressure on, uh, on us was immense, and it was unlike anything we'd ever experienced before. And Elizabeth and I were praying, and we really were crying out to the Lord, asking him for, for protection and guidance and so forth. And he, um, just without fail, when we asked him, he gave us a verse. The next day, a friend called up out of the blue, and said, Peter, I have this verse for you. And it was a verse from Exodus 14, and where, where Moses tells the children of Israel, or the Lord tells the children of Israel as they're approaching the parting of the sea, be still, and the Lord will fight for you. And there was just a great sense of confidence that came out of that. Not confidence in winning the election per se, and I think that you've got to be careful on that, but confidence that the Lord was present with us. And then out of that came um, a desire then, when we won the election, very narrowly I might add, when we won the election, um, we kept that same group together. And they were faithful people. Now, what was, uh, what was a joy to us was they weren't, they weren't people that needed anything. I mean, they were not people that were looking for some political agenda or trying to advance something. These were just people that came alongside us and loved us and prayed for us consistently. 
So I would encourage you to be like-minded, and you're interacting as peers here, but I, was all, I would also be like-minded to think, who are people, um, who, who, are, who are others who can pray for you? And to pray for wisdom and to pray for protection in particular. And Elizabeth and I have prayed consistently that the Lord would knit our hearts together as one, as a married couple, and he has been faithful in that, and we've, we've been the, the beneficiaries of that. So one point is to, uh, to have people praying for you. The other point is um, to think about gathering with like-minded people um, when, you're, when you're out and about in your professional setting. So for us on Capitol Hill, there are a number of Bible studies. And um, you know, I only wish the general public would have a deeper sense of that because they look if all you do is you look at CNN and MSNBC and Fox News in the United States, you'd think that everyone's just at one another's throats. But there are far more deeper connections that are happening, and some of those are happening um, through Bible study groups. And like a lot of other folks, I came and I was invited to a particular Bible study, and I went once or I went twice, and then I slacked off and I stopped going. And then I was told by somebody in the Bible study, um, oh, you're hosting the Bible study on Wednesday morning. We're all coming to your office at 8 o'clock. And I thought, okay, Lord, I understand. I, I, I will attend regularly now. And so out of that came a real discipline. Now, there's a lesson here in that to create the time and to hold that time and don't fill it up, make it a priority. And I would tell my scheduler, I know I've got a lot of fundraising to do, I've got a lot of constituency meetings, I've got a lot of committee meetings and all these other sorts of things, but hold that time on Wednesday morning from 8 to 9 because I'm going to be in the Bible study. And when you communicate that as a priority or when you, when you sketch that out as a priority, you'd be amazed at how everything can, can work around it. Or similarly, we had a discussion briefly last night about holding Sunday as a day that is, um, that is set aside. And we weren't, um, we weren't legalistic about this, bless you, but there was, a, uh, there was a sense that Sunday was a priority and um, there were other people in public life in the United States who've, who've done the same thing. And when, when you told people, hey, it's a family day, by and large, what we, what we experienced was most people were very supportive of that. And they said, oh, okay, then, then great. Let's look at Monday or let's look at another day and so forth. And as you engage more and more and more, as you become, as you build out your own families, you're going to find that setting aside that time is going to become more and more and more of a priority. So last night I mentioned, um, and I... Uh, cited David as an attorney, and as an attorney, he was. Um, he, you're, you're dealing with the substance of the law, and you're dealing with the process of the law. In American jur jurisprudence, it's substantive due process and procedural due process. Okay, here's why these concepts are important. There are substantive things that you're gonna that you deal with, that are pieces of law, pieces of legislation around which you're going to have a very solid view based on your faith. There are things that are not substantive, that are procedural, that are significant in how you interact with even your opponents. So as followers of Jesus, what we need to do is we need to be reflecting how the Lord would interact in those types of settings? How would he interact on a procedural basis? And it's a pretty provocative question because it should inform us on how it is that we, we go, about and doing, uh, go about and conduct ourselves. And let me just give you a quick example because what, what, we've got a fine line to walk. On the one hand, we have a view, don't we, about things that are right and things that are wrong. We're not, we're not a group that thinks, well, just, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, and everybody just makes up and, and lives according to, their, to their, own, um, their own law. We don't believe that. We be, believe in, in absolutes. So, okay, then the question is, how do we interact, and how do we, um, how do we interact in a very tumultuous political environment? One way to do that is to try and find common ground. And let me just give you a quick snapshot 
So I served on the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee is the committee that's in charge of tax policy, trade policy, and health policy. And so we oversee the, um, the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service in the United States, they're the, the tax collectors. Nobody likes them, by the way. And so we oversee them. And we came across a situation, we on the committee came across a situation where it was clear that the IRS was abusing small businesses. They were taking advantage of small businesses, and it was outrageous what they were doing. They were basically shaking them down, saying, we're, we're going to accuse you, we're going to hold all your money up until you pay us $50,000. It sounds as if I'm overstating this. I'm not overstating this. So you should be aggravated just listening to this. It was so aggravating. So I went, I chaired the subcommittee that was in charge of this effort. And I went to the, to the opposite party and I told them about this. I brought this to their attention and they were generally aware of this. And I said, you're not for this, are you? You're not, you're not for defending what the Internal Revenue Service is doing. And they said, absolutely not. So what we did was we built out a coalition where both sides came together around this common ground. And it was an interesting thing because the backstory was the, the, the ranking member, in other words, the, the chief member of the minority party was a congressman named John Lewis. John Lewis is very famous in the United States in that he was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. He's African American, and when he was 21 years old, it was the year that I was born, 1961. And John Lewis was riding buses in the south, southern part of the United States, knowing with certainty that he was integrating these buses, and he knew that he was going to be met with violence at the end of these bus rides. And he was. He, was, he suffered violence. But he did it in order to... Um, prevail. He did it in order to make the United States, you know, and move the civil rights movement in the right direction. Well, he wrote an autobiography that I was quite taken with. And I, I thought, well, a guy wrote an autobiography and he's going to be my counterpart. I'm going to read the autobiography to get to know him better. And so I read it and I was so impressed with it that I bought a copy for each of the members of the committee. And Elizabeth is an oil painter, and she painted a painting that's called Dreams of Freedom. And it's a painting that depicts Martin Luther King giving his famous speech in 1963 on the mall in Washington, D.C. And it's got an image of uh, Abraham Lincoln in the background from our home state. Abraham Lincoln, as we know, was so uh, uh, vital in terms of the, the slave question in, in American history. And I had that painting printed and gave John Lewis uh, a copy of it. Now, this is all happening in a highly partisan institution where there's, there's a lot of tension all the way around. But because of the connection that John Lewis and I had over that, I was able to find common ground. I was able to find something that he had done to celebrate and to agree with, even though he, his vote and my vote on probably 90% of issues, we cancel one another out. We just look at things very, very differently politically. Yet on this, I noticed, I, or I observed, this is, you know, this man did something incredibly significant. And so let's celebrate this. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that there are ways to seek the common ground. That doesn't mean that you walk away from core values. But it does mean that what you're trying to do is to, to do it not just for the sake of doing it, but for the sake of trying to build out and build on the relationship. And I would suggest that some of the fruit of that relationship was the ability then, when we found this scandal that was going on with our tax collectors, to be able to go to the leader of the opposition at that time in, on, on my committee and say, would you be willing to join with us? Now, I'm not suggesting that, that his, his uh, mind was changed or his mind was open to it because of you know, giving a painting and so forth. But what I'm suggesting is that it develops a relationship where we could talk to one another and a, a certain level of trust 
and confidence was developed so that he was able to hear me when I was able to come along and say, this is a bad thing, don't you agree? And then finally, we were able to turn the whole thing um, on its head, thankfully. And the commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service learned that he had no friends on the committee <laughs> because everybody agreed that what they were doing was outrageous and the commissioner then publicly apologized, which was like birthing a calf, by the way, getting an apology out of him, but he publicly apologized. They changed their policy. They returned money to people whom, from whom they had wrongfully taken it. Every member of the subcommittee uh, voted in favor of the bill to take away their authority. Every member of the full committee voted to take away their authority. Every member of the House of Representatives voted to take their authority away. And then it's pending, it went to the United States Senate and one of the most conservative members and one of the most liberal members decided to co-sponsor the bill together and to navigate it through. Now, you gotta work at those things and you've gotta look for those things and you've gotta be attentive to those things. That's not to say that you walk away from other responsibilities, but that is to say that you've gotta be intentional about doing these things. So um, there's, there's, there's also something, and, I'm, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll speak more on this later in the week, and I mentioned it last night, and I think it bears repeating. We're supposed to be different in the public square. As we enter the public square, we're supposed to be different. And what you're observing now is a level of anxiety in our public life that's just palpable. You can just feel it. People in America are very, very anxious and uptight. People in Europe are very anxious and uptight. And there's a lot of different factors. We, uh, we need to make sure that we're not feeding that. We need to make sure that we're not the ones that are, that are adding to that anxiety. We need to make sure that we're the ones that are really reflecting, well, we know to whom we're accountable. That is, we're accountable to the Lord Jesus. And I think if we are mindful of that, then we have an opportunity to, we have an opportunity to, to move things incrementally. Let me make one final point, and, um, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot during sort of just a question and answer time. But we've got this culture, and I alluded to this last night, that's an instant gratification culture, and we all fall into this. And, um, and it's influencing our politics. So the, the challenge that we face is the challenge of taking yes for an answer. This is becoming more and more of a challenge in democracies today. The ability to say yes, the ability to take yes for an answer. And what you see a lot of times is the, um, are people who are dealing and negotiating, not necessarily in good faith, so that is to say, they'll say, well, this is our position. And then, and then the other side moves and says, through negotiation, okay, we can agree on that. And then what happens many times is they, the, 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 the first party says, no, 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 that's not our position anymore. We're, we're gonna move and we're gonna change it. That becomes unworkable. And what I think we've gotta, we've gotta recognize is we've gotta be people that say, no, 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 this is what we said. This was our position. They've agreed to this. Now let's set that aside and move on. And there's a lot of what, I, what, are, what is called goalpost moving. That is changing, changing the goals. And it falls into a trap, doesn't it? And the trap is if your opponent agrees to it, then somehow, then it's not orthodox anymore. Well, you agreed. That means that can't be good enough for me. That's, that is a very dangerous, that's a very dangerous approach. But you see that in democracies all, all over the place. And so we've gotta be very clear that our yes is our yes, and our no is our no. And um, we've gotta be faithful negotiating partners and people that, um, where our word is our bond. And many times that's fairly elusive right now. So there's a lot to talk about here. Um, let me just conclude by saying there's, um, 
we need to hold these responsibilities loosely. And by that I mean, I used to tease my colleagues in, in our Bible study, and I said, there's nothing more former than a former member of Congress. And I would tease them and I'd say, next time you're at the grocery store, look at the yogurt. The yogurt has a longer shelf life than members of Congress do when they leave. <laughs> and so what you find is if your whole identity then is tied up in the office that you serve or the constituency that you serve or the minister that you serve and so forth, that becomes satisfying, but it's short satisfaction because it doesn't last. Nobody, nobody, nobody lasts forever in politics. It's the nature of it. People come, people go. There's an ebb and a flow to it. And to recognize that that is not wherein your identity is found is a very important thing. Because no sooner are we sitting here today than your minister loses or your party loses or some outrageous thing happens or, or something. And, um, and you're out and you're pressing your nose up against the glass looking in. And if all you've done is build up an identity around your position or around the person that you're working for, um, that becomes very, very, very grim indeed. But by contrast, if that is not what, um, what is buoying you, if that is not your foundation, then you've got a capacity to, to walk through all kinds of things and to, and to be grateful for new seasons that come along.